Hey sports card fans, it's John, Wade Boggs fan, back with another video. Hope you're all doing well. Recently, I did a video showing off a care package that Dave Blue Jacket 66 sent me. He sent me this 1923 W515 strip card of Hall of Famer Frank Frisch. Now, I didn't know much about Frank Frisch or the W515 strip set, so I thought I would do this video and do a bit of a biography on Frank Frisch and talk about the W515 strip set. So I hope you enjoy. So let's go take a look at Frank Frisch and the W515 strip set. Frank Francis Frisch was born on September 9th, 1898 and died on March 12th, 1973 and was nicknamed the Fordham Flash or the Old Flash. He was an American League baseball player and manager of the first half of the 20th century. Fritsch was a switch-hitting second baseman who threw right-handed. He played for the New York Giants from 1919 to 1926 and the St. Louis Cardinals from 1927 to 1937. He managed the Cardinals from 1933 through 1938, the Pittsburgh Pirates from 1940 to 1946, and the Chicago Cubs from 1949 to 1951. He is a member of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum and the St. Louis Cardinals Hall of Fame Museum. He is tied with Yogi Berra for most World Series doubles at 10 and holds the record for the most World Series hits at 58 for a player who never played for the New York Yankees, exceeded only by Yogi Berra and Mickey Mantle. Born in the Bronx, New York City, Frisch attended Fordham Preparatory School, graduating in 1916. He went on to Fordham University where he continued to star in four sports, baseball, football, basketball, and track. His speed earned him the nickname the Fordham Flash. In 1919, Frisch left Fordham to sign with the New York Giants of the National League, moving directly to the majors without playing in the minor leagues. He played an immediate impact, finishing third in the National League in stolen bases and seventh in RBIs in 1920, his first full season. Manager John McGraw was so impressed by Frisch that he soon named him team captain, giving him advice in base running and hitting. The Giants played Frisch at both third base and second base early in his career, but by 1923, he was installed as the team's full-time second baseman. Frisch batted over 300 in his last six seasons with New York. He was also an expert fielder and a skilled base runner. In 1921, he led the National League with 48 steals, in 1923 in hits, and in 1924 in runs. With Frisch adding his fiery competitiveness to the team, the Giants won the World Series in 1921 and 1922, winning the NL pennant the following two seasons as well. Frisch is tied with Pablo Sandoval for the franchise postseason multi-hit games record of 15. After the 1926 season, Frisch was traded with pitcher Jimmy Ring to the St. Louis Cardinals in exchange for star Rogers Hornsby. After an August 1926 loss in which Frisch had missed a sign, costing the Giants a run, McGraw had loudly berated Frisch in front of the team. Frisch responded by leaving the team and his previously close relationship with McGraw virtually ended. Playing second base for the Cardinals, Frisch appeared in four more World Series, 1928, 1930, 1931, and 1934, bringing his total to eight. He was the driving force of the Gas House Gang, the nickname for the Cardinals clubs of the early 1930s, which were built around him to reflect his no-holds-barred approach. The Cardinals had won only one pennant before Frisch joined the team, the Giants, would win the pennant only once in Frisch's nine seasons as the Cards' regular second baseman. Frisch played 11 seasons with the Cardinals. 
1931, he was voted the most valuable player in the National League after batting 311 with four home runs, 82 RBIs, and leading the league in stolen bases with 28. The 1931 Cardinals also triumphed in the World Series, defeating Connie Mack's defending two-time champion Philadelphia Athletics in seven games. Frisch became player manager of the Cardinals in 1933 and was named to the National League's first three All-Star teams from 1933 to 1935. In 1934, he managed the Cardinals to another seven-game World Series victory, this time over the Detroit Tigers. Frisch finished his playing career in 1937. His career statistics totaled a 316 batting average, still the highest ever for a switch hitter, with 2,880 hits, 1,532 runs, 466 doubles, 138 triples, 105 home runs, 728 walks, and 1,244 RBIs over 2,311 games. He also stole 419 bases in his 19 playing seasons. His hit total stood as the record for switch hitters until Pete Rose surpassed it in 1977. Frisch also hit 300 for his career from both sides of the plate, the only other switch hitter with more than 5,000 at-bats with this distinction is fellow Hall of Famer Chipper Jones. Frankie Frisch was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1947. After no players had been selected by the writers in the previous two years, the only election since 1942, the rules were revised to limit eligibility to those players who had retired after 1921. Frisch was among the first four players to benefit from the more reasonable field of candidates. After his retirement as an active player, Frisch continued to manage the Cardinals, but was never able to capture another pennant. Frisch also had managerial stints with the Pittsburgh Pirates from 1940 to 1946 and the Chicago Cubs from 1949 to 1951, but without the success he had in St. Louis. Frisch's career ledger as a manager shows a 1,138 win versus 1,078 loss or a 514 mark, including the pennant in 1934. He also spent the first two months of the 1949 season as a New York Giants coach, working under his old double play partner Leo DeRocher before leaving June 14th to replace Charlie Grimm as manager of the Cubs. Frisch also worked for several years as a baseball color commentator on radio and television. In 1939, he called games for the Boston Bees and the Boston Red Sox on the Colonial Network, a regional radio network serving five New England states. He also called Giants Radio in 1947 and 1948, then worked as a post-game host for the team's telecasts in the 1950s. His broadcasting trademark was worrying about pitchers walking batters. Oh, those bases on balls. After a heart attack in September 1956 forced Frisch to curtail his activities, Phil Rizzuto, recently released by the Yankees as a player, filled in for him on Giants postgame shows for the rest of the season. From 1959 to 1961, Frisch teamed with Jack Whitaker to form the backup crew for Saturday Game of the Week coverage on CBS. A number of years after Frisch left the playing field as a manager, he became a member of the Hall of Fame's Committee on Baseball Veterans, which is, resp which is responsible for electing players to the Hall of Fame who had not been elected during their initial period of eligibility by the baseball writers. He later became chairman of the committee. In the years just prior to his death, a number of Frisch's Giants and Cardinals teammates were elected to the Hall. Some notable writers, chiefly among them Bill James, have criticized these selections, including Jesse Haynes, Dave Bancroft, Chick Hafey, Rube Marquard, Ross Youngs, and George Kelly, which includes some of the most widely questioned honorees in the Hall's history. Critics have pointed out that many of these selectees had accomplishments which were less outstanding than those of other players who were bypassed and were only selected because of Frisch's influence. 
Frisch died in Wilmington, Delaware, from injuries suffered from a car accident near Elkton, Maryland, a month earlier. He was 74 years old. Frisch had been returning to Rhode Island from the meeting of the Veterans Committee in Florida when he lost control of his car. Frisch died in the same manner as other New York Giant Hall of Famers Mel Ott in 1958 and Carl Hubble in 1988. He is interred at Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx, New York City. In 1999, he ranked number 88 on the Sporting News list of the 100 Greatest Baseball Players and was nominee for the Major League Baseball All-Century Team. In January 2014, the Cardinals announced Frisch among 22 former players and personnel to be inducted into the St. Louis Cardinals Hall of Fame Museum for the inaugural class of 2014. The 1923 W515 strip set consists of individual cards measuring 1 and 3 8 inches by 2 and a quarter inches that are originally presented in a collection of six strips bearing 10 cards per strip. Each blank backed card depicts a colorful drawing of a player taken from an Underwood and Underwood wire photograph and prominently displays the copyright symbol and UNU at the bottom left. The image is centered near the top of the card, while the card number, player's name, position, team, and league are printed across the bottom. The set leans heavily toward the New York teams, as 39 of the 60 individual cards are players from the New York Yankees, Giants, and Brooklyn Dodgers. There are two cards bearing Babe Ruth's image, number 3 and 47, the set is anchored by Ruth, Ty Cobb, Walter Johnson, Grover Alexander, and numerous other Hall of Famers. Two separate sets make up the W515 strip card series. Both have a similar look and design with colored pictures on the front and blank backs. A total of 70 cards are in the set if you consider the baseball and boxing issue as one, as there are 60 baseball and 10 boxing players. However, they are clearly two different sets as the boxing cards are numbered 1 through 10, in addition to the baseball cards that are numbered 1 through 60. Adding to the difficulty in completing an entire baseball set is that there are two Babe Ruth cards in the issue. Ruth is the only player featured twice. The bottom border of the baseball cards included the player's name, team, and position. Boxing has a name and weight class, as well as their standing in the boxing world as a champion or challenger. Both of the types utilize the same checklist. The smaller standard cards are categorized as W515-1. The second of the two sets, W515-2, is slightly larger than its counterpart. These cards often have parts of the phrase, the Little Wonder Picture Series, printed at the top. Both appear to be available in about the same quantities, although sometimes collectors will pay a little more for the Little Wonder Picture Series cards as they are a bit unique. In addition, there are a few other differences between W515-1 and W515-2, but in short, the smaller 515-1 cards have cropped images and the placement of the copyright is also found in different places. Most strip cards by design are not very attractive. The W515 set, though, tests the, tests the limits by fans and is one of the least artful issues among W cards. Although, personally, I think this is a beautiful-looking strip set. Images used in the set were taken from Underwood and Underwood wire photos. That is represented by the small U and U print found on the cards. Like other strip issues, these are fragile cards. That is because they were printed on a low quality paper stock. These are easily torn or damaged as a result. The Ty Cobb is among the biggest names found in this relatively small set. The cards of Cobb and Babe Ruth are among the more expensive ones in the set. Cobb's card indicates that he plays for the Detroit Tigers, spelled T-Y-G-E-R-S, leading many to believe that the card is a typo. However, because Cobb managed the team, they became known unofficially as the 
tigers, spelled T-Y-G-E-R-S, in some circles, an obvious play on word words on Cobb's shortened first name. The only other member of the Detroit Tigers in the set was Harry Heilman. His car, too, has tigers, spelled T-Y-G-E-R-S, in the name. Some of the more notable cards in the series are cards depicting brothers. One card features the Musial brothers, Bob and Irish. At the time, Bob was playing with the New York Yankees, while Irish was with the Crosstown New York Giants team. Interestingly, the card only calls them the Musial brothers, and while their teams are referenced, their first names do not appear on the card. Other card featuring brothers is one of Jesse and Virgil Barnes. Both brothers were actually teammates on the cards card as they played for the New York Giants. While Jesse started the 1923 season in New York, though, he was traded to the Boston Braves in the middle of the year. Both cards are unique in that they are the only horizontal cards in the set. While the standard cards are the most common, two variations of the cards are known today. A rare variation, and one that is the most intriguing, are the W515 cards that are actually FLIR's first baseball cards. The FLIR company that grew to prominence in the 1980s got its early start way back in 1923. FLIR used the same cards as the W515 issue, only placing an ad for their company on the back to distinguish them. Flair actually holds the distinction of producing earlier baseball cards than famous companies Topps, Gowdy, and Bowman as a result. Finally, a second back is known on the cards as an advertisement for Jersey ice cream. Those backs include a mention of receiving five free cards with a brick of Jersey's ice cream product. These are the rarest of the variations, and not many are likely to exist. The most notable one seen to date is an Eddie Collins version that was sold in a 2015 heritage auction for nearly $500. The Fleer and Jersey's ice cream cards are considered more valuable than the regular cards. The second of the two sets, W515-2, is slightly larger than its counterpart, and some cards include printing for the Little Wonder Picture Series on the borders on the front. The name appeared to be on the exterior of the uncut sheets as the full name does not appear on the cards. It is possible that the entire set was to be called the Little Wonder Picture Series, and these are merely cards at the top of the sheet. Cards are found with only a part of the phrase as it's stretched across several cards. A total of 60 baseball players are included in the set, and the rest of the 100-card issue is made up of other famous personalities. Overall, the cards are somewhat rare. They're not impossible to find, but the majority of W515 Type 2s do not have the printing on them. I hope you enjoyed this look at the background of Hall of Famer Frank Frisch and the 1923 W515 strip set. That's all I have for you. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.